<laughs> hey, Rachel, really nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. I'm so excited. I'm a morning person, so I'll get ready. <laughs> Are you a morning person? I am indeed, and I've already had my coffee, so very, nice. very much ready hey. to go. <laughs> So we are here at Start Out Second Annual Equity Summit. So excited to be here and be a part of this. I'm honored. I don't know if everybody knows about who you are. So let's let's start off with what's said in the stage and the context for what a great human being I found out that you are. But let everybody else know. Thank you. Well, um, I'm Jonathan Mildenhall. I've lived in the U.S. for 13 years. Um, I moved over to the US actually to become global vice president of advertising and creative at the Coca-Cola company. So seeing the opening credits um, from the Coca-Cola company execs was uh, really heartening to me. Um, after eight years, I moved across to San Francisco where I became the CMO of Airbnb. Um, but that's not my greatest achievement at all. My greatest achievement is just two years ago, my husband and I had um, a set of twins, a little brown skinned girl named Dominica and a little white skinned boy named Oliver. Uh, they're two years old now and we now live in Los Angeles. And I've got my own company called 21st Century Brand. And what that company does is it helps companies like Peloton, Pinterest, Uber, and figure out the brand narrative so that um, uh, really we can have a successful and sustainable IPO. Major brands, major career, um, super, super impressed. I, you know, I've been doing diversity, equity and inclusion work for a while now, maybe some of it um, in an unofficial capacity as most of us find ourselves, right? I, I have since in the last eight years had the official title of that work. And when I first started off, it was diversity and inclusion. And most recently, it's become equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I am so excited about equity because to me, that was the missing piece in all of this work. Diversity is increasing representation. Inclusion is making sure that all of the voices are heard and, and, and leveraged and valued. But there wasn't equity, right? We didn't really take the time to understand that there are barriers for some people and that there, there's advances for other folks and how we can make sure that inside of our companies that we break down those barriers and we create access and equal opportunity. What does equity mean to you? Well, equity is really simply about making sure that we have a level playing field so that everybody has the same opportunities to advance and to seize these opportunities, um, regardless of experience. And so let me give you a very, very simple um, uh, example of what equity means. So whilst I was at Airbnb, we were running the uh, internship program. And it was really important to me that we gave um, people from underserved communities um, the same confidence in their internship program and so what we had was soft onboarding for young men and women who had never actually been in a corporate environment before yeah. so we invited them in a week before the internship program started just so that they could have a wander around the office so that it could meet some of the um executives because and candidly speaking it was divided on um race to be honest because some of the underserved um, interns were black and brown and had never been in the corporate environment before. Yes. And yet some of the white interns, um, their parents had invited them into the corporate environment. So yes. they'd been hanging around the corporate environment since the age of eight years old. So they weren't intimidated about getting into a reception area, getting into an elevator, getting into a company canteen. And so the soft onboarding for those interns that felt that they needed it gave them the opportunity to actually show up on the first day of the official program with the same amount of competence because the environment was familiar to them as in this instance, white counterparts. So that's just one example of where Airbnb was working hard to create equity so that the first day experience for the interns was equal. Yes, yes. Um, that's that is points to my what I always say about equity, which is is that it should call upon all of us to investigate 
where the racism, sexism, ableism, homophobia, xenophobia exists in our society, in our organizations, in our processes, in our policies, because without doing that investigation, you are not going to get the results that you're seeking. If you want diversity and to increase representation, then you probably should investigate what's going on with your recruiting uh, and your hiring and your onboarding. And so that's awesome that Airbnb did that. But equity is also a, a personal journey. I know a lot of us work in organizations and we see the inequities, um, especially now since George Floyd and the pandemic and having to stay at home. Uh, we, are, uh, we are keenly tuned in to where inequities lie. And many of us want to push our organizations to do better. I know that you have um, leveled some playing field, especially in a big way when it came to an advertisement that you push for, that you produce, that showed the first gay couple during a, a commercial, during the Super Bowl, no doubt, which I think I don't know how many millions of people watch the Super Bowl, but I know that is some some key expensive marketing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, like thirty seconds is like a bajillion dollars. How did that? Tell me how that came to be because that started with something within you, and then you pushed for it. I would imagine. How did you? How did you get that done? Yeah, so um, it was in two thousand and thirteen, and I was um, running um, Coca Cola's. Super Bowl campaign. Now, Coca-Cola will hey, Coca invest. <laughs> Coca-Cola <laughs> will invest like twenty-five million dollars across the Super Bowl weekend. It's the biggest campaign in the Coca-Cola calendar. And what we were trying to do was we were trying to portray the ever-changing nature of the American family. And um, and so we took a number of vignettes, a multi-generational Mexican family, a Jewish family, a Muslim family, and I also wanted to include a same-sex family. Uh, and, you know, this was in two, 2013, and it was before same-sex marriage had been, you know, granted by the Supreme Court. Yeah. And we found all of the families were genuine families, and all of the vignettes were beautiful. And over the top of that, we were playing America the Beautiful. And America the Beautiful was sung in different languages that reflected the families that we were portraying. And um, I, I knew that I wanted a same-sex family, so we, we found a married same-sex couple. And it was really, it was really challenging because um, we, I presented the first edit and it showed a vignette of the two guys and their wedding rings. And um, to be honest, to some of the senior powers at the Coca-Cola company, that was pushing the same-sex narrative too far because at the time, same-sex marriage wasn't legal across the United yeah. States. Mm -hmm. So it was really, really difficult. And I wanted this um, uh, vignette so desperately to make the final edit. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I couldn't get the ring vignette through. And so I, I had a little bit of a fit and I said, well, if we're not going to do the ring vignette, then I don't want to do any, have anything to do with this campaign. And um, so, you know, I softly resigned. I was like, well, if I can't do it my way, then I'm not doing it at all. Yeah, you took your marbles I, and you went home. Huh? That's <laughs> and I came home. Uh, uh, to my beautiful German husband, and and I said, "That's it. I'm not pushing this through." And he said, "Oh, Jonathan, battle yeah. and war. Um, the battle isn't the wedding rings. The battle is you are about to make history by putting a same-sex couple in a Coca-Cola Super Bowl ad." And he was like, "Go back into the office tomorrow and make it work because it's that family portrait that is really important." It's yeah. not the wedding rings. And so yeah. I went back into the office the next day and um, we finally got America the Beautiful running on the Super Bowl. And it was Coca-Cola's most controversial um, ad ever. Uh, nice. It created a whole shitstorm, candidly, um, uh, as the New York Times reported, um, <laughs> uh, because the haters came out first. And what was challenging for me and I would um, uh, give this piece of advice to anybody who's listening, is now in social media, the haters will not only come out 
against the brand, but they can also find the executives that were responsible for yeah. the work. So haters came out for me. And this is really, really funny because there was one quote, but I will give you an example of it because um, it was very telling. Um, one, uh, one tweet came at me and it was like, Jonathan Mildenhall, you're black, you're gay, you're British, get back to the UK and stop effing with the American national anthem. <laughs> My response to that tweet was, yes, I am black, I am gay, and I'm British, but that is not the American national anthem, so your intelligence is nothing that I need to be concerned with. <laughs> and, and, and what was really, really interesting for Coke and the executives and myself is understanding this. When you're trying to push forward the narrative yeah. on what a diverse and inclusive society looks like, you will always get haters coming oh, at you first. The haters will always come at you first. The people mm -hmm. who are resisting change, the people yes. who deny the injustice in society, they come at you first. Yeah. You just need to have a little bit of patience because then the power of your supporters, your promoters comes yeah. out and it can shift the narrative in such a voluminous way. And that's what happened with Coke. And I'm very, very proud of the Coca-Cola company because two years later, after um, uh, President Trump was inaugurated, the Coca-Cola company chose to rerun America the Beautiful on the Super Bowl two years later. I had nothing to do with it. And <laughs> Coca-Cola made history because it's the only Super Bowl ad ever in Super Bowl history to run two times in two different Super Bowls. Oh, I've got chills listening to that story. Also... We owe a big thanks to your partner. So where is he? Bring him out. <laughs> well, actually, because we've got two kids, he's just taking the kids to preschool. <laughs> so. well, tell him I said thank you. <laughs> because that now we have so many commercials. Now we, now, like you started and it, it's so, it, it points to how hard this work is, how hard it is to be the first. To be the first. But... But the impact you can have with the bravery behind it, I mean, I just, it almost brings me to tears. So I'm going to keep talking so, <laughs> so I don't start crying. Um, I know people are hearing the story and they're probably like, well, I'm not Jonathan, you know, I'm not charming. I'm not a CMO. I'm not, right? So what advice do you have for someone who is earlier in their career, maybe, you know, doesn't have the influence, maybe doesn't have the title, but wants to help advance this work in whatever organization or wherever community they're in. Yeah, um, and I get, I get it. I'm 53 years old. I now have got a body of work that proves that my creativity can create massive value for businesses. Yeah. Uh, and candidly speaking, I, I'm in a place where as a father of a brown skin girl and a white skin boy, I do not want to bring her up in a society where she is anything less than and has to put anything more than just to stay at parity to her younger brother. Right. Uh, and so I've, I've got this conviction now because it's not about me and my career and my reputation. It really is about the society that we're building for yeah. the next generation. That said, the one thing that I would encourage everybody to do is really truly understand that your difference, mm. the way you are packaged, the way that you structure your values, the way that you think, the way your background, all of your difference is now your power, yeah. it, it, your value in the workplace. Yeah. There has never been a time in corporate America, in startup America, where people are actively looking for difference. Yes. So I need you to all just think about taking power from your difference and having the confidence to present your difference. And I mean that in lifestyle, but I also mean that in the way you critically think. We're yes. looking now for difference to create value. And so yeah. people should think about their difference and how their difference can create, create value. And sometimes your difference is one of the things that makes you feel the most vulnerable. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. There's so much um, uh, academic understanding now of how you can find strength in your vulnerabilities. So it's your difference is going to create value now, more so than ever before. And your vulnerabilities can actually be turned into your strengths. And so I'd just like you to be thinking about those two things. Difference yeah. equals value. Vulnerabilities can become strengths. Oh, I love that. Every time I, I'm doing a speaking engagement, I get a young person who asks me, how do, how is it, how can I... Uh, you know, show up in an organization, especially being the only black woman leader in all organizations I've been at, eBay, Yelp, X. Uh, and I say, because I know for a fact that what I'm going to say, how I'm going to think is absolutely going to be different than any of the colleagues in that room. And so I have to be there. I have to say the thing that's on my mind because it's, it's so different. And I am empowered by that. Like I am, re put me in the room with the with all white cisgendered white males. They are not gonna. They're not gonna come with what I've got, right? So I love that you just said that. That is super empowering. Um, DEI in in a lot of companies, um, you know, especially in the last year, I have to say has been a smidge performative. But we're not going to talk about that. We are going to talk about a little bit of the bottom line. Because I, I feel like what you mentioned with the Coca-Cola ad, it probably brought in some money and maybe some new folks and probably some new, you know, it does affect, inclusivity does affect a company's bottom line. Have you seen that in any organization where you worked where it's like, we, we did this thing, it was a most inclusive ad or it was a most inclusive whatever, and look at the impact that it's had to. Absolutely. So when I got to Airbnb, um, I, I first wanted to just, I was really, really heartened when I got to Airbnb because the LGBTQ community at the Coca-Cola company was so closeted, so closeted, but the um, uh, black executive community at the Coca-Cola company was so vocal. Mm, uh, and and I actually just thought that that was corporate America. I thought that you know, the uh, queer community was in the closet and the black community was celebrated and embraced. Loud and proud. <laughs> but that's because I was working in Atlanta for the Coca-Cola company. Well, wow, um, Then I moved to San Francisco and mm -hmm. it took me three days at Airbnb before I saw another black person. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, wow, I just realized there's no black people. Yeah. Um, and yet the most powerful um, uh, employee group was the queer community. Yeah. And, and, and it was, just like literally young workforce in San Francisco. There's not a lot of black execs in San Francisco, painfully, um, but the queer community, very, very vocal. And so I wanted to understand whether or not there was an argument to actively promote the queer community in Airbnb's marketing. And so I got the data and the data told me that Airbnb guests had a higher index on being queer because gay, People travel more frequently because they don't have kids. Yes. Uh, and also the host community was over indexing in the queer community because yep. the host community, the gay community have bigger houses without kids. So they've got spare rooms. And so, so there was a business argument to promote the LGBTQ community. And when Caitlyn yeah. Jenner came out, uh, Airbnb ran an amazing, amazing campaign around it called Is Mankind. And it was this little baby walking to this glass door and it was the voice of Angela Bassett. I wanted to have that interracial white little baby and then Angela Bassett's voice of mother nature. Oh, is yeah. mankind, are we good? It was so powerful. And at the end it was mankind, womankind, transkind, we are all humankind. And we put that out and my goodness, did the business spike on Abby. Here we are supporting Caitlyn Jenner because she was a brave, brave pioneer, the front yeah. cover of Vanity Fair, the yeah. highest profile trans um, uh, woman that the world has seen. Yeah. And, and, uh, and we wanted to show the support. And it was so great because when I was looking at the data of this massive spike in business, it wasn't just the queer community. It yeah. was the liberal straight community who were also like, oh, Airbnb is quite progressive. I want to associate myself with those values. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's just one campaign, but 
in, in, in short, that kind of work that was focusing on promoting a diverse community for Airbnb was one of the drivers that took us from a $1 billion company valuation in 2014 when I started to a $35 billion valuation by the end of 2018. And everything that Airbnb was doing was to promote diversity and inclusion on the platform. And we put all of that in marketing. And now Airbnb is a $100 billion company and arguably the most influential travel brand on the planet. Okay, y'all heard it here first. <laughs> Drop the mic. Anybody in any organization, any executives, there is a tangible return on the investment in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Absolutely. And, and it, it's not just what I, what I loved about what Airbnb ended up doing is it wasn't just about diversity, equity, and inclusion as the veneer for marketing. We were then doing it to help the different communities so we were for we were literally focused on bringing more black and brown hosts onto the on, onto the yeah. platform who that. needed different onboarding tools from a tech company because their cultural um uh, uh, mores and nuances were slightly different yeah. so airbnb was redesigning the platform to ensure that the platform spoke to different communities and then we would put those different communities out in the marketing. So it was inside out, outside in. Well, now you make me want to go and get a Coke and book a trip. Like I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm in support of these stories and how these companies are showing up. It's so exciting. Um, I know we, we, are, we, we don't talk about this dimension of diversity, but since you mentioned it, my friend, you are 53 years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now I'm starting to sweat. <laughs> and so, you know, we have to talk about the generational diversity in our organizations because it is bubbling up. Now, look, I'm a Gen Xer. I am 46 years old. Now, don't y'all tell anybody. Okay. This is, this is, this is family. You wear yours better than I wear mine. I have to <laughs> Moisturizer. Uh, but what I will say is that the advice my baby boomer mother gave to me when I started work, I remember I, first day, you know, before joining Accenture on K Street in DC, no doubt. I had my navy blue suit with the shoulder pads and pantyhose I on. Navy blue suit, my first oh, day. Oh, <laughs> Hot mess. I'm so thankful for the freedom of uh, <laughs> But she told me specifically, do not talk about race. Do not talk about your personal business. Do not talk about politics. Keep your head down and ask your boss before you leave every day if there's anything you can do for him. Moms assumed it would be a him. Mm -hmm. Before you left for the day. That was the advice from my baby boomer mother. And I'm a Gen Xer. And so the fact that I even talk about race, politics, you know, all of these things at work blows my mother's mind. So for you, how how do you think we could do better at, you know, bridging the gaps that inevitably exist between the generations? You know, we got Gen Zers. That's y'all are a whole different flavor. The millennials, <laughs> y'all are getting older now. And, you know, baby boomers and us Gen Xers are looking to leave because I'm tired. But like we all have to work together. So what yeah. do you think is the uh, the bridge for all of that? You know, I, I've got two things that I practice um, uh, so, because, and it, it doesn't matter what industry you are in, this one word is something that as you get older, you become so much more conscious of. And a lot of people don't actually create practices to ensure that they stay it. And that word is relevant. You mm. have to, as a 50, as somebody in their mid 50s, I have to, have to, have to take time to ensure that I can be relevant in my communication with my millennial workforce and with my Gen Z workforce. Yeah. And you know, the older execs that actually don't practice mm. relevance are the ones that actually I feel have no place in the workplace 
but you and so it, the, the onus is on you what are you doing so that when you engage when you communicate when you lead when you manage when you direct a younger workforce your practices are relevant to them yeah. and and that can be i'll give you one example which anybody who's worked with me will know i'm not that tech friendly i'm not tech forward and when i set up my own company we've now got 35 uh, um consultants around the world on 21st century brand <clears throat> and they all want to work on slack and i don't like working on slack i'm like email me email me and they're like no jonathan it's all on slack you're the one who's gonna have to change and yeah I was like, you know what I, it's right if i want to communicate with my um uh, workforce i'm gonna have to use the tools that they use to communicate Otherwise, my communication is less relevant. Yeah. So, yeah. so relevance is the one thing that I, I um, would give everybody. And that's something that you've got to work hard at. But then the other thing is just being very conscious of the value of your experience. Um, because every Gen Z, millennial, I think we all want the comfort of experience. Yeah. And so you can bring value because of you've got, like I've now got 34 years in this industry. And so I can bring value through my experience, but it's really, really important that I work hard to make sure that I'm showing up in a relevant fashion. Uh, and that way then you can just, you know, break down all the barriers between the different generations of the workplace. Yes. So no more sending things by carrier pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> that's, just, that's just my, it's just my, my issues. Like I've just got to stay relevant with communication channels. Yes. Yes. And I would, I would probably add, you know, I'm the kind of person that believes I can learn something from anyone and everyone. Right. And I think, you know, executives who may be at a different generation should make a purposeful and intentional invitation to listen to their younger workforce. Absolutely. Um, you know, this is the one case with human execs and leaders where curiosity doesn't kill the cat. Curiosity <laughs> is the lifeblood of any executive that wants to stay relevant. So asking the questions and showing up in a way that makes people think that you're listening to understand, you are not just listening to then advocate a preconceived idea or notion, listening yeah. to understand from all those around you, especially the ones that are different in age, race, gender, sexual orientation, that's when you as an executive can really, really start to develop further. Absolutely, absolutely. So we have just a few more minutes. I'm being pinged by our wonderful <laughs> showrunner. <laughs> that we need to wrap it up. Um, any final words, anything that you would maybe tell younger Jonathan, who just oh. started off, who maybe wasn't as confident in his sexuality and his, um, you know, leadership and any of that in the workplace, what would you say to that younger Jonathan? I would say two things. One I've mentioned is over time, Jonathan, you will come to appreciate how much value there is in your difference. And as you continue to push yourself, you will end up befriending the imposter because the imposter syndrome that everybody has, particularly people who look, think, sound, behave differently, yeah. can be crippling. Yeah. And now I'm at a stage where if I haven't had that narrative in my head you're not worthy you're a fake you're not going to be able to pull this off what do you mean you're showing up with this kind of person doing this kind of work you're going to get found out now if i don't hear that at least once a week then i know that i'm not actually pushing myself hard enough because all yeah. the imposter syndrome is to me is an opportunity to grow so when yeah. i start hearing that i go oh this is exciting because this is really telling me that I've never done this before. I've never worked at this uh, level before. Uh, and so I'm going to grow. And so I would encourage everybody who's listening to start to befriend the imposter syndrome, because all it is, is a prelude to growth. Uh, okay. And we all need to continue to grow as workplace dynamics are changing so rapidly. I love it. I love it. 
Thank you, Jonathan. I have grown immensely. I am a big fan of Airbnb now, a big fan of yours. And you're going to have a Coke later on today, for sure. And Rachel, can I just say thank you for shining so, so brightly because you do it in an incredible way and you truly are inspiring. Thanks, my friend.